Forgiveness. Does it seem like just about everybody is a little less forgiving? Does it seem like accusations and excuses fill our discourse, but that a forgiving word is increasingly rare? On our last show, we began a conversation on the topic of forgiveness. We'll take up that subject again today on this edition of Craving Answers, Craving God. I'm Chuck Rathard. And I'm Aaron Miller. Aaron is the pastor at St. James Lutheran Church in Glen Carbon, Illinois. If you'd like to listen to the first part of this conversation, click on episode 10 of Craving Answers, Craving God. In the New Testament, the phrase forgiveness of sins appears at least 13 times, six times in the Gospels. So we move from a general discussion of forgiveness to the more specific Bible term, forgiveness of sins. Does this refine the meaning of the term? Aaron? This, uh, maybe this is just playing with semantics, but I think that when we talk about forgiveness, we're always talking about forgiveness of sins, that something has been done that's damaging to God's creation, either ourselves or to our relationships or uh, to the environment or to our relationship with God. There's a, you know, there's a way to say, somebody steps on my toe, and they say, hey, for, oh, I'm sorry, forgive me. I, I'm not going to say, I forgive you for stepping on my toe. I'll probably say, that's okay, because it's not really, they've not really morally damaged me. But if they commit a sin, I'll say, I forgive you, or I should say, I forgive you, because I think forgiveness is almost exclusive. It should almost exclusively be used in terms of what we do to pardon sin as Christians in Jesus' name. How close is the subject of forgiveness of sins to the main emphasis of the Word of God, from Genesis to Revelation? How high does it rank among the important topics in the Bible? Oh, the, yeah, I don't know how you rate those sort, that sort of thing. It's certainly up there. I, I don't know if I, I, maybe we'll have to create a Mount Rushmore of you know, biblical doctrines, but it's got to be up there because uh, sin, sinfulness, the brokenness of the world, it comes in pretty early in the story, Genesis chapter 3, and it does a heck of a lot of damage. It tears up relationships. It tears up the environment. It tears up people's minds and souls and bodies. It kills us all in the end, right? Everything decays because of it. And right away, God comes up with a plan to fix it, and we call that plan forgiveness. It's not the word forgiveness isn't always used, but God's plan to take away all the bad things that we humans have done to his creation. That's, so it's certainly right up there. So then, do those who sin less need less forgiveness, and do those who sin more need more forgiveness? I think there's, prob- there's probably a, a way that we can talk about that, and it makes good biblical sense. I mean, Jesus implies this. At one point, he says to... I'm going to mess this up, Chuck, but at one point he says to... Um, to, to, to some people about a woman who has spent an awful lot of money to pour some ointment out on him out of gratefulness and love for him. Uh, The people are shocked that she's wasted this money. And he said, she's been forgiven much, so she loves much. I know it's not the main point here, but just his phrase, she's been forgiven much, implies that she, that that there's, there's more than she's been. She, she's been forgiven more than maybe some of you. And it's possible, too, Jesus is being a little bit sarcastic. Maybe he means more like she gets it more than you do. I think there's, there's, you know, this goes back to the old chestnut about, you know, all sins are equally wrong, but some sins are worse. There's a difference between wrong and bad. We're all equally sinful, and so we all equally need God's forgiveness. But there are some sins that are more damaging. You know, it's like the... um I've said this before. You know, two plus two equals three hundred and sixteen is a wrong answer. Two plus two equals five is also a wrong answer. Now, two plus two equals three hundred and sixteen is worse. They're they're both equally wrong. On a math test, you're gonna one point off for each one of those, and you know you don't get bonus points for being closer. But there is a sense in which some sins are more damaging. Uh, you know, it's more damaging. It's less damaging to be angry at somebody, to hate somebody in your heart than it is to kill that person. But Jesus insists that in God's eyes, they're both equally wrong. So did you just say that we're all equally sinful? 
Yeah. Did you just put me in the same basket with Adolf Hitler and the most despicable people that have ever lived? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I just did that really flippantly, didn't I? Uh, me too. As for, in terms of wrongness, yes. In terms of badness, no. Uh, I, I lose my temper at my kids. I say passive aggressive things to my wife to try to push her buttons if she's irritating me. I'm lazy. I fake through conversations acting like I'm interested in the other person when I'm really not. Or, or is any of this as damaging as Hitler's genocide? No. But is it wrong? Is it broken and is it evil? Is it the seedbed for, is there within the things that I do, the, 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 the seedbed of future, larger, more damaging sins? Absolutely. In God's eyes, they're both wrong, and so they both need forgiven. So is forgiveness of sins, the concept, is it a one-time event or is it ongoing? Yes. Yeah, to both of those things. I, so um, you're, you're talking about like Jesus forgiving us, what, what Christians talk about. I'm thinking Jesus on the cross. He says, it is finished. Right. Forgiveness of sins is finished. That's yeah. what I'm taking from there. So if it's finished, then it's done. Right, yeah. Well, so, so this, okay, so this is, there's a little bit of difference between Jesus and us. Jesus forgives our sins. That's a one-off for all time experience. The, the blood of Jesus covers sins past, present, and future. Any sin that you've committed in the past, the guilt is gone. It's been paid for. Any sin that you're going to commit in the future, the guilt's already been paid for that as well. Christians, in addition, also insist that repentance of sins needs to be an ongoing thing. We confess our sins. Um, John encourages Christians to continue confessing their sins because Jesus is faithful and just to forgive our sins. We, we pray in the Lord's Prayer, uh, Father, forgive our trespasses, even as we forgive those who trespass against us. So there's, this, there's also this sense in which w while the guilt of all of our sins in the future is gone, the wrongness of those future sins is not taken away. The culpability is not taken away. I'm, I'm going to lose my temper at my kids next week, and I can't say... I wasn't wrong. Jesus' blood covered that up. I can lose my temper if I want to. Yes, Jesus' blood did cover up. The guilt is gone. But the sinfulness... This is, so now we're talking about the, the distinction between our position in Christ and our condition. So our position is completely perfect. Legally, we've been declared not guilty. Our condition, though, is still... We still do bad things. Do you need to pray that the blood of Jesus Christ will take away your guilt? Uh, yes. As you should do that, and then if it has, you, you don't need to pray that prayer anymore. Should you continue praying as a Christian for the rest of your life that God would forgive you for the guilt, for, for, the, for the culpable and sinful and wicked things that you do? Yes, you should continue praying that because those still remain. Can you see where, at least for me, sort of holding in tension the idea that the forgiveness of sins is accomplished, it's a finished work, but on the other hand, I'm going to sin today, I'm going to sin right. tomorrow, and I'm going to need forgiveness again, how those two things seem to be in conflict? Yes. I mean, they're definitely, it definitely is complex enough that it should be a good indication to us that it's touching reality. It's, if, it was, if it was more simple, it might cover up one certain part of our experience or how we think about the world, but not the whole thing. So for instance, to, to know that your sins for all time have been forgiven in Christ, that's a, you know, that, 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 that gives a comfort, a real deep comfort. But what about the, what about the other part of your experience where you, know, you, you, um, you, you lose your temper in traffic? What do you do with that then? Well, th this grapples with that part as well. So the great text, Hebrews 10, verse 14, the writer of Hebrews is describing uh, Jesus' sacrifice for humans on the cross, and he says, Jesus has, uh, what's he say? He sacrificed once for all time those who are being sanctified. Jesus' blood pays once for all time. Actually, let me look at it. I'm going to just quote it to you here. Um, 
For by a single offering, Jesus has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. So those, those two, Jesus has perfected for all time, past, present, and future. We have been made perfect by the blood of Jesus. But then he goes on to say those who are in the present being sanctified. So which one is it? Is it in the past we were made perfect? Or is it in the present we're being sanctified, we're being made more and more perfect? They, they both can't be true. Like one part of it says that they, can, they both can't be true, and yet the Bible insists that we are, uh, as in, in the words of Luther, both saint and sinner. We're both completely holy and acceptable to God because he's forgiven our sins and also sinful and broken still until our deaths or the return of Jesus so that we continue to need ongoing forgiveness, ongoing realization of that forgiveness of the, uh, that we have received by the blood of Jesus. Do these two things fit into the realm of, of spirit and flesh? Uh, I think Paul says in Galatians something about how the, the flesh and the spirit war against one another continually. So when forgiveness of sins comes for the spirit, that spirit is made alive again, the human spirit, and the term, I guess, is born again. There is new life there, eternal life, but the flesh still continues to behave like the flesh. The flesh still bears or carries in it sin, and then thus we're left with this war between the two, I guess, until the day we die. You, I believe, have tapped into something that's deeply biblical, although... I think that I've come to understand this is controversial. I mean, you know, controversial among theologians. Not it's not this is not gonna get anybody's fire boiling out there who's listening to this, probably. That when Paul t- talks about flesh and spirit, he means uh first of all, he doesn't mean like spirit by spirit, he doesn't mean our inner person, our souls. He he means the Holy Spirit. And by flesh, he doesn't mean our bodies, he means our sinful nature. I'm convinced that in Romans seven and eight. When Paul says we are no longer in the flesh but in the spirit, he means that Christians have been translated from one sort of existence, the human nature, the fallen human nature existence, the flesh, to a different sort of human existence being controlled by the spirit. So um, I wouldn't use the words flesh and spirit. Paul doesn't use them in that way. But Paul, I mean, just to sum up and try to be as clear as possible, I, I believe that what Paul means when he says you're in the spirit, he means you're a regenerate Christian, you've been redeemed by Jesus. And when he says in the flesh, he means that you are outside of that, that you are still living in your fallen human desires, controlled by your fallen human desires. But that doesn't mean that your concept that you've brought up, Chuck, is right, that those people who are Christians still struggle in the day-to-day with their old human desires. This is why Paul says previously in Romans chapter 6, uh, don't be slaves to unrighteousness. He, he says initially, he says in Romans five, you are no longer slaves. You've been set free by the law of God, uh, but by, by the uh, by the law of Christ. But then he goes on to say, since you've been slept, set free, don't be slaves anymore. Which seems like a contradiction too, but it's capturing your point that you made that we have been set free, but still there's this tendency to want to fall back in these um, uh, old sinful patterns of being slaves to sin. Maybe you've had this happen to you, I don't know, but how would you or how do you respond to a person who says, Aaron, I've done so many bad things in my life, so many terrible things. I just don't think God can forgive me. Yes. Yeah, people say this. Um, there's Have two you heard that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sometimes I, well, let me just say it this way. There's two ways. There's two things that I hear a lot it's, it's, that I hear from people talk about this. They'll say, you know, what you just said, uh, per- perhaps, uh, you know, I've, I've sinned too much and God could never forgive me. That seems to be less and less a problem in our culture now. There are people who struggle with that. More and more people say, I don't, I don't, I, I don't really sin. I'm not that bad. I don't need God to forgive me. So, you have the, so they have these two people approach th- this question of the need for forgiveness in two different ways. One is I don't need it, and one is I'm too bad to receive it, which seems like opposite ends of the spectrum. One seems sort of free and licentious, and I, I do what I want. I don't need any help from anybody. And one seems sort of paralyzed by uh, the, the dependent need for a crutch. 
but they're actually, at their heart, they're both idolatrous. They both fear, love, and trust in the self more than God. One person says, I myself don't need any help from God. One person, the other person says, I myself am too sinful to get any help from God. They both have made an idol of the self. They are both judging God's capacity or willingness to forgive based upon their own standards, based upon themselves. That's the determining factor. God can't forgive me because me. And I just don't think this is fair to God to to judge that beforehand. Also, and this is my sneaking suspicion, is that there's more than maybe uh, people who struggle with this maybe need to watch out that perhaps more than a dash of self-pity, the the deliciousness of self-pity has crept in. People who People who are really in need of something don't usually say, oh, I don't deserve that. You know, you're, you're falling out of an airplane. You know, people don't usually say, oh, I'm falling too fast. I don't deserve a, I, I don't deserve a parachute. You know, people who are fall, falling off a cliff don't, don't, uh, don't look at the tree branch, which is right there, which could hold them up and say, you know what? It's my fault. For falling off that cliff. I don't deserve to grab that treatment. Most people, if they need help, they grab onto it. That's why I'm suspicious if somebody says, I'm too sinful, that what they really mean is, I'm still too important to, 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 to relinquish. The, you know, one more night with the frogs, as Pharaoh says to Moses. Just, you know, one more night, let's have one more night. That there's a little bit more, there's a little bit of like, I'm not ready yet. I'm still a little bit too important to let, you know, but it's, and the fact is, is if, they would just they would just look at the cross and see how much Jesus loves them and see that what you know what Paul says in Romans 5 is that if God is willing to give up himself for us the, the almighty is willing to give up his own life for us then certainly it's true that grace that power of grace is way bigger than the power of sin so exactly what do you do? And I realize that from person to person, yeah. details differ. But what do you do when somebody looks you right in the eye and says, I just don't believe that God can forgive me? Well, it's, usually I say uh, it's a very high view of yourself. It's a very high view of your own. Are you telling me that the sins that you've committed, that your sins are way more powerful than God's grace? And if they say, yeah. Then I mean, all I can do is show them the gospel, right? And to say, no, look, this is bigger. This is bigger than you. This, the God who created the world became a human to rescue you. To don't, you know, it, it, okay. If, if you don't, if you're not ready to accept Christ right now, to believe that your sins are forgiven by the blood of Jesus, that's one thing. But don't presume that somehow it's because you're bigger than God. That somehow you're more powerful than God. That somehow what the decisions that you've made somehow trump the decision that that God has made to rescue you, because that's just unrealistic. If God is God, that's unrealistic. In the book of Leviticus, we find the word forgiven 10 times. That's more than any other Old Testament book. And in every one of those 10 verses, the word atonement is found, as if they're somehow linked. Yeah. How do these two words connect? Atonement. That's a good word. I I used to hear that word atonement, and I, this common pastor thing, if any of you who are listening grew up in church, you've heard pastors say, atonement means at one meant. And I used to think, that's pretty cheesy. You know, and it, <laughs> I'm thinking it right now. Yeah, that's pretty cheesy. You, you know what's interesting? As it turns out, that's actually the etymology of the word. <laughs> it, that's not just like a cheesy, that's actually what the word means. It's, it's uh, you know, it goes back, it's an old word, but it actually literally the words for at one, the process of reconciling two things which were once separate but now are being brought together. And then the reason why interesting the reason why in the book of Leviticus it's so important is because oh this this is helpful to our conversation hopefully. Forgiveness of sins is not this random well God wants to be nice and do it sort of thing. In Leviticus God has decided to set up shop with his people. He's decided to move to earth and live in this tent right in the middle of Israel, right in the middle of his chosen people. But that creates a problem, of course, because Israel, like all the rest of us, are broken. Um, they're self-centered. They, 
they do damaging things to each other and to uh, themselves and to the environment. So what God has to do is he has to create a system where he and all of his holiness can live in the midst of these sinful people. Now, maybe somebody out there is thinking, well, why can't he just be a nice guy and like let it go? Problem, though, is that holiness has nothing to do with his emotions. It's his character. His character is holy, and our character as humans is broken and sinful. It has nothing to do with God liking or disliking us. It has to do with a difference of natures. Nobody would ever say that the fire somehow dislikes the paper. It has nothing to do with emotions. But if you put paper in fire, it's going to get burned up. That's the situation that God found himself with his people Israel. He wanted to live with them, his nature being what it, what, what it is and their nature being what it is. That was going to be incompatible unless he can figure out a way to do the at one thing, to forgive their sins, but not just in a purely legal sense so that, oh, you know, hey, we're cool with each other, but so that he could be in their presence, so they could be at one, so that God could dwell with them. And so that's what the sacrificial system in in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Leviticus, where it's described in detail, vividly, the sacrificial system is designed to, to forgive sins, but to forgive sins so that God and his people can live together. So far in our conversation, even in our previous show and now today, I get the feeling that the forgiveness of sins is a, a an expansive thing. It's almost its abundance almost can't be yeah. measured, right? Right, yeah. So it's there and it's abundant and it's for everybody. And then in Mark chapter three, we read, "But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin." Now, I think we have people who are listening to us right now that are troubled, maybe even deeply troubled by this verse. There may be people listening to us who believe that they have committed this so-called unpardonable yeah. sin. So what's your take on this verse? Yeah, can, can we run back real quick to the previous question? I want to add something to sure. it, and then we'll sure. hit Mark chapter 3 here. Um, I, I need to say that the writer of Hebrews, writing after Jesus has died and risen from the dead, insist that, you know, the text that you brought up in Leviticus, that that actually has been fulfilled by Jesus. It is now the shed blood and the resurrection of Jesus, which makes us at one with God and allows humans to once again live in God's presence. You want to know God, you're out there, you want to know God, you got to go to the cross, you got to go to the blood of Jesus. The Bible insists that it's only God's own blood which can reconcile us to Jesus. Okay, thanks, Chuck, for letting me run back there like that. So Mark 3, yeah, so this is, uh, I actually know a handful of people. I, I, I'm talking currently, this is interesting that you brought this question up. I'm talking currently with at least a handful of people uh, who struggle with um, uh, the unforgivable sin described in Mark 3 and elsewhere. And, you know, so what do we make of this? Um Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. That's Jesus' word. In the context, he's doing um, uh, some miracles, and uh, the religious leaders who are opposed to him say that he's possessed by um, demons, and the demons give him power to do these things. And Jesus says, basically, you better check yourself. Like You can say bad stuff about me if you want right now, but... If you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit who's actually giving me this power, you are damned guarantee. And so what are we going to do with this? Um, what is, you know, the, the, the main point of what he's saying here in verse 29 of Mark chapter 3, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. I, I really do think that the main point can be captured by this present tense here. Whoever is blaspheming is another way that it could be translated if you are blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, then you, there is no forgiveness for you. It's actually, it's emphasized in the next verse. In verse 30, Mark explains, he says, for they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Well, he's already told us that. Mark's already said that. What's the point of repeating it again? We already read the story. Why does he need to say after Jesus says that, for they were saying? I think the point is not the information so much as it is the verb tense. Mark explains because they were saying in that moment, Jesus has an unclean spirit. That's the sin, is to be currently saying, Jesus is not Jesus. Or you could say Jesus was, you could say Jesus was demon possessed. You could say, well, he claimed to have the Holy Spirit, or his followers claimed that he had the Holy Spirit. That wasn't really the Holy Spirit. He's just a, you know, he's just a guy. Maybe you say he's a wise teacher or whatever. The sin is to currently say that. That sin currently committed is unforgivable. 
It's the only sin that we're told currently committed that that currently committed is unforgivable. Like so, when when, when I die, I will go to my death having unrepentant sin in my life. I don't want to. I you know I, I want to repent of all my sins. The, the problem though is that because sin has done a real number on my brain as well as my soul and my relationships, I don't know all the sins that I commit. I commit lots of sins every day that I'm not aware of, or some sins I commit that I'm convinced are actually virtues, you know, uh, sin, sin, especially especially culturally approved sins, pride, self reliance, um, firmness without mercy. These are things that I'm proud of myself for, and yet they're sins. And when I die, I'm going to carry those sins with me. I'm going to carry that pride with me. But as a believer in Jesus Christ, I'm convinced that my unconfessed pride will be completely forgiven by the blood of Jesus. But if I have unconfessed rejection of Jesus, that's the one sin that will not be forgiven. Any other sins that we commit will be forgiven, even if they go unrepented of on the last day. But unrepentant unwillingness to believe in Jesus is the one sin that God can't forgive. So this handful of people that you were talking about, what is typically the response when you talk about the unpardonable sin with people? Are they more inclined to say, oh, that's such great news. I, you know, I never thought of it that way. But, or are, are they more inclined to say, no, eh, it's, thank you for trying, but it's, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm just stuck with this. Which way does it go? Yeah, I, I don't know if you want to. So the, the, uh, some of them are listening to this right now. So I, I love you, brothers and sisters. Um, for these, so, there, so there's, uh, check it out sometime. G- Google the word scrupulosity. There is. You can't even spell it, let alone Google it. Yeah. It's, uh, or you could Google religious OCD. And it's actually a thing. And uh, people, so people who struggle with this notion that like, I've committed the unforgivable sin and I can't get rid of it or I, I repent of it, but it keeps popping back in my mind. Um, and so here, 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 here's your question. What's their response? Their response typically when we have conversations is to say, okay, okay, I, I feel good about this. Thank you so much. And then a week later, to text me or call me again and say, I, I think I committed the, un- I-, I think I did it this time, or I think that I was wrong last, I really did. How can I know for sure? So like all OCDs, scrupulosity, the, the, scrupulosity is a desire for control, for certain knowledge. It's an idol. It can be an idol, this desire that I, I want to know for certain that I have not committed this sin. And so a lot of what, when I talk to people who struggle with the unforgivable sin, a lot of times we talk about the unforgivable sin, but a lot of times that's not the main issue. The main issue is the desire for control, the desire for certainty. Control and certainty are things that only God absolutely owns. Uh, We are commanded to trust in him. And uh, religious OCD frequently, um, I don't don't know if this is, now we're rabbit trailing here a little bit. Religious OCD frequently is, um, a, a desire to be God. It's the pr- primal sin. We all commit it in different ways. In, in their particular ways, this desire to, to have God-like control and certainty, and it manifests its, like, itself in this, like, I, I, I can't trust. I don't want to trust. I want to be sure. Somebody prove it to me that I've not committed this sin. I just, I don't think I've ever had anybody say to me, Chuck, I think I've committed the unpardonable sin. You know, yeah. what do I, I don't think, th- but to hear you talk about having not just one or two experiences right. like this, but to have many yeah. to, uh, I guess, maybe sometimes go to bed at night thinking about this as you go to sleep. How am I going to get through to so-and-so on this question or any other question for that matter? Yeah. Um, do, you have a, do you have a plan? Do you have a strategy for breaking <laughs> through uh, the hardcore yeah. when people won't peel their fingers back off of what they're holding on to? Um, no, well, not a real strategy, honestly. So God's word, the first time I had this discussion w- with somebody, and it's been so bizarre, Chuck, because when I say five people, I mean, I, it's, it's five people and it's all happened within the past several months. It's like, bang, 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 bang like some sort of like, you, you know, contagious disease or something. 
Now, so when I first started talking to somebody, I had this experience. We talked about this text. We talked about other things. We talked about their past life. And I had this great feeling like, okay, they're satisfied. I made a breakthrough. They called me a couple of weeks later and said, I, you know, I, I don't, I think I've committed the empire. And so part of me is like deeply frustrated and thinking, I already told you what this text means. Chill out. And then I realized, oh, you know what? This is something they're struggling with. That's their issue. You know what your issue is, Aaron? You want certainty and you want control. You want to be able to say the magic words to them, to snap your fingers, to be the magic pastor and solve their problems. And it's not working because you can't do it. And you have an OCD problem too. You need to trust God just as much as they do. And so it's been a real adventure for um, all the, the, those of us who are having this discussion right now to, to together learn to have these idols uh, crushed and swept away by the blood of Jesus. And it's just this ongoing battle, but it's been a real sweet battle to learn about forgiveness of sins with each other. Well, I want to thank you, Aaron, for this conversation on forgiveness, a topic that goes all the way from the very broad in general to the deeply specific. And we've enjoyed listening to it. And we want to say thank you to our listeners, those of you listening to Craving Answers, Craving God with Aaron Miller, pastor at St. James Lutheran Church in Glen Carbon, Illinois. Now, if you have a question for Pastor Miller, please go to our website at stjamesglencarbon.org and click Contact Us. You'll be able to leave a message there. I'm Chuck Rathert. Thank you for listening. <laughs>